just kidding. Hey, turn in, your, turn in your Bibles over to John chapter 7. We're going through the sayings of Jesus. And this morning we're looking in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. And this is, a, this is really a key passage where Jesus did something that attracted, no doubt, a lot of attention. This happened, as it says, on the last day, in verse 37, that great day of the feast. Now, this was one of the biggest, the, the great day of the feast is uh, what we call, we generally call it the Feast of Tabernacles, or sometimes it's called the Feast of Booths. It's, in Hebrew, it's the Feast of Sukkot. And the word means a booth or a tabernacle. But this was an eight-day celebration that was instituted in the book of Exodus, whereby the children of Israel were to, every year for eight days, they would live in basically little huts um, with palm branches over the top of a little hut. And it was to remind them of their journey in the wilderness. And as they would, and to this day, Jews celebrate this, where even in their backyard, some of them Orthodox Jews, will put up a little hut and sleep in the hut. Um, and as they lie there, they look at the stars and they remember the promise that God made to Abraham that his descendants would be numbered like the stars. But they also remembered how they lived in the wilderness in tents for 40 years. And God allowed their people to survive. And, of course, by providing manna for them. And so food is a part of the celebration. And then also um, the water that came forth from the rock when they needed it is also a key feature. Because for the Jewish people, they look back and they're like, that was amazing that our nation survived that kind of treatment. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is a time when they celebrate that. They celebrate this uh, provision by God in the wilderness. Um, some Jews, I should say, today, they'll pitch the little hut out in the backyard, but they'll just eat their meals out there and then come into their bedroom. You know? So there are varying degrees of this celebration. But at this time, again, it was an eight-day celebration from a Sabbath to a Sabbath. And this was the last day of that feast. And so it was a huge celebration. They dance all around. And, and one of the things that they would do at that feast is the, the high priest would send someone with huge jugs of water down to the pool of Siloam, which is just outside the temple area a little bit, fill jugs up from the pool of Siloam, bring them up to the temple, and they would pour the water out on the south end of the altar, the, uh, the place outside the holy place, and the water would like flow down over the temple mountain down the southern steps. And so this was like the crescendo. And so it's at that moment, perhaps as either they were lugging the water jug or as it was flowing down, Jesus stands up and starts yelling. <laughs> and look at this. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, if you're in a place where it's hot and you see water, it tends to make you thirsty. And at this point, as water is flowing down, remembering how God quenched their thirst in the past, and Jesus stands up and identifies himself with the quenching of thirst and says, hey, is anyone thirsty? It's kind of like if I am standing up here and I pull out a water bottle and I start drinking it and I go, oh, oh that, that tastes good. All of a sudden you would start to feel 
thirsty too. It's, it's almost contagious. Thirst is an amazing capacity that the human body has. We, we need fluid. We need water. When you're born, a baby is born, it's about 80% water, composed of about 80% water. By the time you're an adult, men are normally around 60% water and women around 50% water. But what happens is as soon as our body becomes even slightly dehydrated, as soon as the percentage of water starts to drop to a certain level, we have, God's created us with this capacity to somehow know that this is missing. And so you look at water and, and it's like, yeah, I want that. I need water. It would be, we would die if we lost our capacity for thirst. And, you know, there's nothing more refreshing and nothing more fulfilling than when you become a little depleted and you get some water. I, this last Monday, we went up to Yosemite to um, hike up to the top of Vernal Falls to sprinkle my mom's ashes. And, and so hiking up, and, and this time of the year, there's not a whole lot of water in Vernal Falls. If you've ever seen Vernal Falls, when it's big, like in the spring, it's just huge. But this time it was still a pretty waterfall. If you had never seen it before, you'd think it was cool. But the trail going up to the falls, which is called the Mist Trail, because when there's water, a lot of water in the falls, you get soaked on the Mist Trail. And I always look forward because you hike up the first you know, three quarters of a mile, and you're getting tired and hot, and then that mist just feels so good. Well, this time, we're going up this granite face, and it's in the 90s, and there's no mist. And, you know, you're always wrestling with how much water do I carry, because the weight of the water weighs on you too, but you know you need water, and sometimes you don't anticipate it. And so Monday, I was just I was sore from walking up all these steps, but also kind of dry. And I couldn't wait until I could get to a point where I could drink some more water. And so you start thinking about times in the past when water was good. I remember when Calvary Chapel first got the uh, property that they had down in Mount Palomar. And we were trying to figure out what to do with the land because they wouldn't let us develop a conference center there. Somebody came up with the idea of there's a lot of water under Mount Palomar. And so I was up there when they drilled down and took out the first water. And it was 34 degrees coming out of the earth. Oh, it was so good. It makes me thirsty just to think about it. And I just drank a bottle of water in anticipation of doing this message. I knew it would make me thirsty. But our capacities physically to be refreshed and renewed, in a sense... When we thirst and we drink, what I'm doing is saying who I am, what my body is made of, has been depleted. And I am going to renew that. I am going to refresh that. And that's the capacity that we talk about when we talk about thirst. It's really an amazing capacity. The word refresh. When we think about water, we often think about, oh, it's so refreshing. Well, Refresh, re means again. And fresh is a word that originally, it was an old French word, but it meant to not have salt. So you have salt water and you have fresh water because they would use salt as a preservative. The idea of something fresh is it's something new. It's something in its original fresh container. And, and so in the same way, when we are refreshed or renewed, it's like starting over. It's like going, I'm running out, I'm missing something, and then I take that in and it's like, wow, a fresh start, a fresh renewal. So as Jesus addresses this imagery in an area of the world where you certainly, I know what it's like to be thirsty in Israel for sure, he, he makes this proclamation, this announcement. And, it, and he says, if anyone thirst. Now, I like that because I'm one. Anyone, any person. What he's saying is, this is available to everyone. This is an invitation that I'm just not making to special people. Hey, if any of you guys are thirsty, I've got something for you. 
but he's opening this invitation and saying, if anyone thirsts. And then he says, if, you, if you're thirsty, and basically the idea, and we use the term thirst to, you know, to refer to any capacity, any need that we feel we're missing. So we talk about people being thirsty or hungry for, for love or excitement or sleep or whatever. But if you feel a lack, if you have a sense that something is missing, then he says, come to me. Come to me. In other words, Jesus is declaring here in front of a large crowd. He's saying that I am actually what it is that you're lacking. When you feel that something is missing in your life, you will find it in me. And you, if you come to me, you'll end up finding what you really need. Now, most of us in our lives could make a long list of things that we think are lacking in our lives. Maybe you go, you know what I'm really missing is excitement. Or you know what is really lacking in my life is a healthy relationship. Or do you know what's lacking in my life? A level of income that's dependable so that I can be, feel like I'm, I'm secure. You know what's lacking in my life is a good place to stay. Or what's lacking in my life right now is, oh man, I should have eaten breakfast. I'm, my stomach's starting to churn. But what Jesus says is actually, it all comes down to me. It's approaching me. By doing that, you will discover what's really missing in your life turns out to be something that I can provide. And Notice it, it's, always, it's never the idea of a person is going to provide what you need. Spiritually, you will never get everything that you need by coming to church, by coming to a pastor, or by listening to particular content. As beneficial as all of that is, the only real benefit to coming to a church or listening to a pastor, is when they take you to the one that really can provide for your needs, and that is Jesus Christ himself. And so as we gather every week, what we are doing is kind of collectively approaching him and saying we need certain things, and we've come to the conclusion that you are really what's missing in a part of our lives. And so he says, Come to me and drink. Receive that which I have to offer. Now you can, you know, there's an old expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Same thing is true of people. You can bring them to a place where the answer is right in front of them. And yet, you can't make them partake. You can't force feed them. It's so frustrating when we see people that we know and we love and we understand exactly what they need, but they don't understand it. They, I have some friends whose son's really been messed up with drugs, and so he finally agreed to go to rehab. But after being there a few days, he decided he didn't want to and he took off. That's so frustrating, especially for a parent who's been praying, oh, that that you know you would respond and you would get help and and it's a christian program and it would be so good for him but hey the bottom line is no you have to do this you have to drink yourself you have to participate yourself so jesus is making a bold declaration he's saying if you feel like something's missing in your life it's going to turn out to be me it's not that he's all we need, but it's when we come to him, he helps us identify other things and provides those for us as well. Now, it's interesting because so often people will use this verse even and this kind of terminology and make it a pitch for non-Christians to become Christians. And, and then we would say to people, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ? If you haven't, you need to come to him, and then he will provide everything that you need. 
Now, that's absolutely true. That's not a bad application of this, but let's be honest. (laughs) Most of you have accepted Jesus Christ. You have come to him. Are you quenched? Are you being renewed? Are you feeling like I have everything I need? For most of us, if we're honest, wouldn't we have to say, well, not necessarily. But see, here's the thing. You don't just come to him once. In the Greek, the present tense is a tense that means this is continuous action. And so the verbs thirsting, coming, drinking, these are all in the present tense. So it's an awkward translation, but a a very literal translation of this would be, are any of you, if anyone is thirsting, then be coming to me and drinking. It's all a continuous action. It's something we need to do completely. So for many of us, we hear this and we go, okay, I'm going to come to Jesus. And so we accept him as our Savior, and that's a great first step. The first step really is to understand you're missing something, and then to come to him. But we forget that this is an invitation that he has made for a constant, ongoing way of living. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, and yet you still have a great sense of there's stuff that's missing in my life, then the answer to that is still to understand coming to him. Now, a lot of times... As Christians, what happens is we come to him, and then we're like, okay, that didn't totally do it. And so then we begin to depend on other people, other situations, other hopes and dreams, but it's all him. It's all about him. And he just says, your life needs to be a life of being continuously renewed and refreshed by coming to me. You know, Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, refresh their strength. They'll mount up with eagles, they'll run and not be weary, they'll walk and not faint. As soon as we stop receiving from him, and as soon as we go into denial, and we act like, nope, I got everything I need. You know, we, how many times nowadays do people say, if you say, hey, can I get you anything? Nope, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. At some point, wake up and at least acknowledge, no, sometimes I'm not good. Sometimes I don't feel so well. Sometimes I am frustrated. Sometimes I'm sad. Sometimes I'm depressed. Sometimes I'm lonely. And to at least acknowledge, I'm thirsty. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, said, I thirst. What makes us think that we won't? And it is not an indication of being a bad Christian when you thirst, any more than it's an indication that you're a bad human if you, if you thirst. You're just being an irresponsible human if you're thirsty and you don't drink. And so, as followers of Jesus, as those who continue to follow him, it's, it's about honestly acknowledging our lack, our need, that we're, there's something missing, but to realize all along the way, what's missing, he can provide. He desires to provide it. Our answer is always centered on him. And so he cries out. And even as he said, I'm the rock in the wilderness that provided water for the children of Israel, I'm your rock as well. I am your provision as well. And if you can be refreshed, if you can find that place of quenching, that place of satisfaction, that place of peace, it's going to be because you spend your life coming, acknowledging, drinking, participating in him, allowing him to refresh you allowing him to make you new. 
The Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. As soon as we live on yesterday's experiences, then we are depleted of that which we ultimately need. And so Jesus just lets us know the way life ought to work for you spiritually is in the same way that your biological body needs to be constantly replenished and refreshed, so your spirit needs to be constantly replenished and refreshed by coming to me, sticking to me, holding to me, listening to me, praying to me, connecting with me. That's where the refreshment comes about. Now, he doesn't stop there, but he says, whoever believes in me. In other words, if you believe this, and so you're someone who really comes to me and really drinks, then he says, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, what does that mean as the scripture says? Because the idea of the scripture saying that out of your heart would flow rivers of living water, you can't find a scripture that this is a quote of. And so people have made a big deal about it. I mean, there's, in Isaiah 44, there's a, there's a passage that relates to this because it talks about the waters being poured out on you and, and about the, um, you know, the Holy Spirit being involved in that. There are other passages throughout the scriptures that talk about the water that he wants to give and uses this imagery. But I don't know, I'm not sure what Jesus had in mind here, to be honest with you. I don't think it's a big deal. He may have been referring to and paraphrasing one of those passages in Isaiah. Um, he may have been talking collectively about all of the promises that God had made and encapsulating those as scripture. Whatever Jesus was talking about, he knew what he was talking about. So I'm not too shook up about that. I want to pay attention to what he's telling them. But notice this. When we are thirsty, all of our focus is on taking in the, the moisture that we need, taking in the, the water that we need. But it's kind of strange that Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me, and out of your heart is going to flow vast rivers of living water, of fresh water. So don't miss this. He's saying, if you come and receive from me, what's going to happen is refreshment is going to come from you. And at first that seems kind of weird. And, and then sometimes even we think of it as the only reason he wants to refresh me is so that he can use me to refresh others. But this isn't just him accomplishing his purpose. The truth is, for most of us, when things are missing in our life, the thing that is missing the most is the feeling that we matter to others. The thing that we desire the most is to produce something meaningful to others. The real thirst that we have is the thirst for significance. And, and that's why when people in our lives treat us like we don't matter, it just feels like it sucks the life right out of you. Because we're designed to make a difference. We're designed to matter. And the, the, the most horrible thing that someone can do to you is, make, is to discard you, make you feel like you don't matter. The greatest thing is to feel like, I just made a difference. I actually was valuable to someone else and useful to them. And, and God knows that. He designed us that way. And so he says, when you receive and continuously receive by responding to the thirst that you have the result is going to be you drink in but it's going to flow out it's it's going to multiply for you think about alcohol a lot of times when we talk about drinking that's what we're talking about oh do you drink well of course i drink everyone drinks your body would would deteriorate if you didn't but alcohol, why, why do people drink? 
basically, I think there are two reasons, and I'm not an expert on this, but in just thinking about it, some people drink so that they can be more sociable. Because, and, there, and, I, and I've talked to many people who, when they drink, they feel like they loosen up. And therefore, they're more fun to be around. And I've seen people who, when they had something to drink, they did seem to loosen up a bit, and they did seem a little more funny to be around for a little while. Usually you keep watching, and at some point it deteriorates. But some people drink so that other people become more interesting. <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, I think you would be really fascinating after I had about three drinks. But the other type of, of drunk is the person who feels so disconnected that they drink to be alone. And that's probably the most dangerous kind of drinking when an alcoholic drinks by themselves. What that's saying essentially is, I am just going to knock myself out because my life doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to make a difference to anyone. And so I'm just going to anesthetize myself. But all of that has a connection with the fact that we were designed to be created. We were designed to be connected. And so that work that God wants to do in our hearts as we receive, then out of our heart flows something. Now he goes on to say, John supplies this detail. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. And he said the Holy Spirit hadn't yet been given because Jesus hadn't been glorified. Now Jesus talked about this and he said, it's actually a good thing for you that I'm going to go to heaven because if I didn't go to heaven, then the Holy Spirit couldn't come and be with you in the way that he's going to be. The Holy Spirit was a gift that Jesus left those who follow him. The Holy Spirit is a personal revelation of God. He is God the Spirit. And the Bible teaches us that he lives within our hearts. And so somehow we have to understand the Holy Spirit in light of what Jesus is saying here, if we're really going to grasp what his whole point is. How does the Holy Spirit affect our lives? If this flowing forth is the exhibition of the result of us being renewed, and then this is what comes forth from our lives connected to the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, the scriptures tell us, Paul said, talked about being filled with the Spirit, and he talks about gifts of the Spirit. And so the gifts of the Spirit is a part of this outflowing. But unless I am drinking from him, then the gifts of the Spirit are not going to be exhibited in my life. The gifts of the Spirit are the things that make us useful to others. But the other thing is called the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit comes forth. As the Spirit's working in my life, I see increasing love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. All of those things are exhibitions of what comes out of a life when the Holy Spirit is working within the life. And we all want that. And between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, it's like, oh, if that comes out of my life, that would be so awesome. Now, the Holy Spirit is, Jesus talked in, in John 14, he's explaining about the Holy Spirit, and he said, the Holy Spirit is already with you, but the day is going to come when he will be in you. So the Holy Spirit's always with you, and for all of us. Before you were a Christian, the Holy Spirit was with you. It's the only way you could even desire to connect with God. It's the only way you could even have the conviction of wanting to do what's right as the Holy Spirit works with you. He, he worked with us in order to bring us to Jesus. But the Holy Spirit comes in you when you become a Christian, Paul said, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, then you don't even belong to him. So you have with and in. For the disciples, I believe, the Holy Spirit was with them all along. But after Jesus rose from the dead, they were in the upper room, and Jesus, it says, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
So at that point, the Holy Spirit came inside. And from then on, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ, the the God who became a man who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, when you put your faith in him, God comes to live inside you, and that's pretty cool. But there's another preposition. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, to go and wait for the Spirit to come. But he said, and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit's with everyone. The Holy Spirit is in people who have trusted in Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit comes upon us to empower us in order to represent him and to do his work and to connect with others and to share his love with others. And you can do that without the Holy Spirit coming upon you, but it won't work. It won't be effective. Functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit or something that we call being filled with the Spirit, the word filled meaning controlled. Remember Paul in Ephesians when he said, don't get drunk, be filled, be controlled by the Spirit. And he uses it in the present tense. Being filled with the Spirit is not something you do just once. Being filled with the Spirit is something that we need to do constantly. Now, there are people who would say, okay, you need to accept Jesus. Now you just need one more thing. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. Then you're done. No, I would agree with those things, but it's so much more important for us to understand this is a daily renewing and refreshing that needs to go on. He is the well from which we draw. The Holy Spirit wants to have an ongoing, vital relationship with us because it's through the Spirit that Jesus continuously quenches our thirst, addresses what's missing, helps us to go through those things that we face in life because I don't care how good I feel when I wake up in the morning. Life has a way of sucking all of the moisture and nutrients and everything out of my body so that by tomorrow, sometimes by lunch, sometimes by your morning break, you're like, wow, I felt so good when I came in, but I'm thirsty. And he says, that's why you need to be coming to me. That's why you need to be drinking of me. That's why you need to be spending time in my word, time in fellowship with me, time communing with the Holy Spirit, allowing him to work, allowing him to use his gifts, allowing him to give you the fruit of the Spirit. And understand this, the result of doing life right as somebody who follows Jesus is a life that is renewed constantly. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So when we look at our lives, we would never, it would never be accurate to say, you can judge spiritual maturity based on how much information you have. So wow, you've learned so much, so you are a spiritual giant. You're not a spiritual giant because you learn a lot of stuff. What makes you connected spiritually and quenched spiritually, in a good sense, is when you, your life emits those things of the Spirit, that relationship with Him, and what does that look like? It looks like refreshment. It looks like, wow, you're new. You seem fresh. You seem alive. You seem energized. And you know what else? It has that effect on others. Now, he says that this fresh water, this living water, comes from your heart, (laughs) out of your heart, out of the central part of your being, living by the heart. It's interesting that throughout history, the heart has been seen by almost every culture and every religious tradition as being the center of who you are, the center of your emotions, in our modern technology, we've, we've tended to believe, though, that, yeah, that was just kind of a figure of speech. It's really the brain where everything comes from. 
But they're finding out through modern research, and it's really fascinating when you read up on it a bit, that more comes from the heart than you think. In fact, instead of the brain telling the heart what to do, 80% of the time it's the heart that's telling the brain what to do. And people actually connect from the heart. Your heart emits electromagnetic radiation that goes outside the body and can be detected by another person. Your heart is a transmitter that a brain is able to receive and transmit to the heart. That's why it actually is your heart when you begin to fall in love, when you begin to fall out of love. It's a heart issue. And so Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, who comes into the deepest part of your being, wants to renew you by quenching that thirst, whatever is missing in your life, and by then allowing who you really are to flow out in a way that touches other people, that can encourage other people, that can make other people feel loved, that can, that can connect with them, that can depict love and joy and peace and all of these things that just flow forth. And that will go on forever. That is something that, you know, the Holy Spirit will always be flowing out of our lives if we allow him to. But the only way for the Spirit to flow, and it's interesting, you don't get the Spirit to flow out of you by going to the Spirit. You don't need to focus on the Spirit. The Holy Spirit never wants people to focus on the Spirit, The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will always testify of me and bring glory to me. So what happens is we come to Jesus, as he says, keep coming to me with your thirst and participate, partake of me. And the amazing thing that happens is the more we focus on Jesus, the more we sense the Holy Spirit working. And if we don't stop it, And what's going to happen is we are renewed, and a natural result of that is other people begin to be renewed by contact with us. But again, it's always coming to me. So hopefully, our lives are such that when people get near us, what's flowing out of us actually refreshes them. However, The goal is not for them then to keep coming back to us for refreshment. If you're hiking out in the wilderness and you find a a beautiful spring and you fill your canteens with water and you begin, oh, it's amazing. And you hike a ways and you find some people and they're dying of thirst. And you give them some water and they're like, whoa, that's great. You wouldn't say, stick with me. In fact, Let me go back. You stay here. I'll go back and fill the canteen again, and I'll give you more because there's more where that came from. Now, what you would do is take them and show them where they can get their own water, their own provision. And that's how it works with him. We come to him. We participate. We receive from him. The Holy Spirit works in our lives. Therefore, we take what's been renewed in us. We share it with others. It's refreshing to them. And then we let them know it's all about Jesus. It's why we're spending a year looking at what Jesus says. That's a way to come to Jesus. Read what Jesus says. Listen to what he has to say. It will refresh you. I've never even once read things that Jesus said and not come away by going, wow, that was so fresh. And it's kind of funny, people have mentioned this to me as we're looking at the sayings of Jesus this year. I have people go, you know, I thought I knew everything Jesus said, and every scripture that you picked is something I've heard before, but it's exciting to hear it in a fresh way. Well, that's exactly what he wants to do. So here's how life is supposed to work. I am honest about that something's missing in my life, whatever it is. So I take that thirst and I come to Jesus and I am honest with him. I pour out my heart to him. I let him know what's missing. And then I receive whatever it is that he gives me back for that. And all of a sudden I feel like, wow, I feel like a new person. 
I feel like I've been refreshed and I've been renewed. And if you spend time with Jesus and you don't feel renewed, then you're doing it wrong. You're, maybe you're just listening to things that people have told you in the past. Maybe you're trying to relive old expressions. But you will know that you have drank from Jesus when you feel like, ah, oh, that was good. And however much time you have to spend and however you do that, that's the idea. But the way you'll really know it's happened isn't just if you feel new, because you can maybe convince yourself, oh boy, that was good. But what kind of an effect are you having, am I having, on other people? There are some people who are just refreshing when you're around them. They just, you know, you get around them and you feel like, oh man, that was a breath of fresh air. And we all, instantly, you can think there are certain people who are like a breath of fresh air. There are some people, as they say, who can brighten up a room just by walking in. On the other hand, there are people who can brighten up a room just by leaving. <laughs> it's like, oh, I feel so good that they're gone. I thought that conversation would never end. And so to have a healthy self-awareness is to go, Am I causing people to be renewed and refreshed by what I offer? Or am I causing them to tense up? When you get an email from someone, depending on who that person is, you can pretty much know, is this something that's going to give me a blessing and a fresh start for the day? Or is this something that's going to give me another reason to worry? But all of that is how the Spirit works. So for us, the real question isn't, okay, have I come to Jesus? Have I drank of Jesus? No, it's much simpler than that. Am I the kind of person who people are refreshed when they're around me? When they see me, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how hard things are, they talk to me and they feel like things are under control. God's good. And not in a phony sort of way, in a reality, a sense of his mercies are new every morning. If I am not giving that impression to people, then there's something where I need to go back and go, I guess I haven't received enough from the Spirit by coming to Jesus. And maybe I need to clear my schedule a little bit more and spend some more time as we talked about last week, at his feet, listening to him, allowing him to quench my thirst, to fill me with his spirit, and to cause me to produce. There's a, there's a song um, that Bob Dylan wrote years ago called Positively Fourth Street. It's one of the greatest bitter songs ever written. He's, he's writing about a hypocritical person who's, who's done him wrong. There, there's a line in there that says, you know, whenever you see me, you act surprised and say, hey, how are you? But you don't mean it. He said, you know as well as me you'd rather see me paralyzed. Why don't you just come out once and scream it? <laughs> and, but at the end of the song, he, he, this is such a powerful wind-up to the song. He says, I wish that you could stand in my shoes and I could be you. I wish that you could be in my shoes because then you would know what a drag it is to see you. <laughs> And that's, you know, I know it's cruel, and for some of you who are really sensitive, you hate that, but for those of you who are really honest, you know people who you just, I wish you'd know what, how depressing it is to see you or to hear from you. That's a great litmus test for us. Is it a drag to see us? Is running into us something that just depletes people? Now that doesn't say as much about them it doesn't say as much about our lives. It doesn't say as much about somebody else we can blame. What that lets us know is you are not being renewed. Because if you are renewed, the Spirit flows forth from the center of your being and has a renewing effect on others. There are times when I have been so drained, but just 
seeing someone and hearing their story and being encouraged by them, I feel like, wow, I, I'm seeing life from a whole different perspective. That's what he wants our lives to be. And that happens because we have the Holy Spirit who, if we allow him to control us, if we allow that flow where we're receiving from Jesus and the Spirit's flowing out of our lives, you'll know it instantly. You, it's why the scriptures say that the way you know somebody's a Christian is by their love. Love the fruit of the Spirit. Love the outflowing. Love that's renewing. The great thing about love is you feel like everything's fresh. Remember the first time you really fell in love? The whole world came alive. It's like if you wear glasses the first time you got glasses. And you didn't want glasses. You thought they looked nerdy. And, you know, but all of a sudden you got glasses and go, whoa, I never saw this before. That's the effect that happens when we are drinking from Jesus. When we are taking our thirst, taking what's missing, and going to him with it and saying, I think I need all this other stuff, but I know what's wrong. My, my water content in my life has become depleted, and I need for you to fill that. And as that happens, as you go to him, the Spirit begins to work. He starts to use us. Our gifts spring to life. The love begins to flow from our lives. And ultimately, you'll notice it because people look like they're actually glad to see you. If nobody really cares about you, that's a good indication that you are not bringing refreshment into their lives. So don't try to bring refreshment into their lives. Receive refreshment yourself. It's time to start over on a daily basis at least to so say, I'm thirsty, I want to drink, I want it to flow. I want to affect people in a way that I bring renewal and refreshment into their lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who, if we come to Jesus, will flow out of our lives and will be refreshing to people that we see, to people to whom we come in contact with. Lord, we're sorry when we walk around saying how thirsty we are and we don't go to the well that we know will quench our thirst. Renew us today. Renew us this week. Renew us each day of this week as we are thirsting and coming and drinking, allowing your spirit to flow once again in a new and a fresh way. Thanks for being what we need, being who we need, but help us to take the choice to come and drink. May our lives refresh others as we receive refreshment from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. If you're here today and you never have since that fresh start in your life, you've never really come to Jesus at all. He says, anyone who thirsts, come to me and drink. So if you're someone who there's something missing in your life and you haven't come to Jesus even once, I would encourage you to come today. There'll be people down here in the front who would love to pray with you and introduce you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the one that can make your life start over right now. You can forget whatever has happened, whatever failures, whatever successes that you haven't let go of. Let it all go and start life over today. Begin to see things in a fresh and a new way by having your sins forgiven and your life begin again with Jesus, allowing him to flow from your life, allowing your life to finally be able to affect others in a more positive way. So if you need that, come on down. If, on the other hand, you say, yeah, I've, I'm a Christian, but there's not much refreshing about me, I'd suggest today that you'd go spend some time with him and just tell him what you're thirsty for and allow him, through his spirit, 
to come and work in your life. Don't go away from him until you feel like you've had a fresh start, until you feel renewed.